Hello, it's Colin here from Colin's Beauty Pages, talking about the serious subject of how much using talc increases your risk of getting ovarian cancer. Talc is pretty widely used, so if true, this is a pretty big story, and also rather bad news. It's such handy and useful stuff, it would be a great shame if we had to stop using it. And of course, it would also be bad if people are getting cancer who otherwise would not. The only people who would be pleased would be the people behind the campaign for safe cosmetics. They've been going since around 2002 and have yet to find any unsafe cosmetic product. In fact, the cosmetics industry has probably got just about the best track record of consumer safety of any big industry. This isn't because the people who create cosmetics are exceptionally careful or remarkably skilled. It's just a fact of life. You use cosmetics in very low quantities. You don't eat them, you don't drive around very fast in them, and you don't plug them into the mains electricity. So basically, there just really isn't that much that can go wrong. So it isn't surprising that the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics have had a thin time of it trying to find really anything to campaign about, even though they are obviously very well funded, as a quick look at their very swish website and high production value videos shows. But with talc, they might well be thinking that they've finally managed to pin some actual damage to actual consumers onto a proper mainstream product. An American jury recently found Johnson & Johnson guilty of causing the death by cancer of a customer who used Johnson's baby powder. The family have been awarded millions and maybe at last the campaign have an actual case. The founder of the campaign, Stacey Malkin, was on Twitter issuing advice straight away. Avoid talc in the pelvic region and on babies, she said. They have a whole web page devoted to the subject and if it can kill you on the face of it, then this sounds like good advice. This looks set to be a big story because there are many other plaintiffs lining up to bring similar cases. If US juries continue to dish out big payouts and the appeal courts uphold them, then I think we may well have seen the end of talcum powder as a mass market consumer product. And if talc is carcinogenic, we should be glad to see the back of it. Losing a popular product is a small price to pay for reducing the risk of cancer, and the cosmetic companies shouldn't have been selling something dangerous in the first place. It's only right that they should pony up to compensate their victims. So let's try and quantify just how big this risk is. The study that triggered it all off was done in 1982. This was a small retrospective study a retrospective study is one which looks at data on women who had ovarian cancer and compares it to a group of similar women who didn't. Retrospective studies are a lot less reliable than prospective studies where you set the whole thing up first and track it to see what happens. When you do your study retrospectively, you're hoping that you've picked two comparable groups, but you are relying on the memories of the people involved, which is risky, and your selection is inevitably influenced by your preconceptions. Nonetheless, it is a tool that can be used if you are aware of its limitations. This study suggested that women who had used talc were twice as likely to get ovarian cancer as those that didn't. This is a pretty big difference, so it was worth investigating further. When you get a surprising result, the first step is to think through what the possible explanations are. The one that springs to mind first is that the talc is causing the cancer and that we need to get out there and stop people using it. We all have a built-in self-survival bias and are inclined to look out for danger, but there are quite a few other possible explanations. The talc could be triggering a condition that is already there, and so the talc users get diagnosed sooner, but we're always going to get it all along. Or it could be that the talc use is correlated with something else. For example, if you spend more time applying talc, you might increase your exposure to light, which is a known carcinogen. Or maybe ovarian cancer creates symptoms before diagnosis that talc is good at treating, and this means that cancer sufferers just find talc more appealing. And we can't be sure that the problem is simply talc. It might be the chemical nature of talc, or it might be nothing to do with what the talc is composed of, and everything to do with the particle size. In which case, if people stop using talc, but use something else instead, it might make no difference. It could even make things worse. So, 
We have a small study that might not be reliable, and even if it is, is open to interpretation. This isn't to be in any way critical, that is just the way these things work. If talc is a dangerous ingredient, it's not going to be established by one study. A paper is there to report what has been found, but it usually takes a while for a picture of what is going on to emerge. Since then, there have been about 20 investigations into various aspects of the question of whether or not talc is harmful. None of them have shown talc in as bad a light as the very first one. I've picked out what I think are the key ones when it comes to assessing just how risky talc is. The next study, carried out by much the same team behind the first finding, was published in 1999 and was a bit bigger and was based on more recent exposure, so it had less chance of getting it wrong. It still showed an association, but the association was much less strong. This time it was only a 20% difference. You'd still be worried, but a 20% increase in risk is a lot less than doubling it. Incidentally, if you knew nothing about medical research before watching this video, there is something to learn right there. The same team studying the same problem using perfectly good scientific practices can come up with two pretty different answers to the same question. That's the way these things work. It's best not to put too much reliance on data from a small number of studies. Another large study, but still retrospective, came out in 2008. This again had an association between talc use and cancer of about 20%. In fact, it was just under, and the statistics indicated that there was a 1 in 20 chance that there was in fact no difference between the two groups. So, although it did confirm the 1998 study to some extent, it still left plenty of room for doubt. There have since been two more retrospective studies. One found no association. The other came up with similar numbers to the earlier study, i.e. not a huge effect and rather weak statistical support for that effect. The authors themselves weren't particularly happy with their numbers. On the possibility of talc being the cause of ovarian cancer, they said no stronger adjective than possible appears warranted at this time. These kinds of study are always going to be weak. What you really want is a double blind study that shows the more talc you apply, the more incidences of cancer you get. But you can't do that study. For a start, there is no possible placebo. You can tell if you've been given a sugar pill or a pill with an active ingredient that um, there's no difference between them, you can certainly tell whether or not you're using talc. And in any case, medical ethics would probably prevent you from carrying out this trial. If you couldn't show reasonable grounds to believe that talc was a carcinogen, there would be no reason to carry it out. If you could, then it would be unethical to deliberately expose women to that risk. But in 2010, we got the best we are likely to get. This was a prospective study following a large group of women and seeing how their experiences pan out. This was a very big bit of work involving 66,000 subjects. The result was that no association between talc use and ovarian cancer was found. It looked like we had our answer. But just to complicate matters, they looked at subsets of the data as well. When you looked just at the postmenopausal women and ignore all the other results, a slight association could be found. It was about 20%. Our brains love patterns, and it's tempting to see in this the confirmation of the earlier data and an explanation of the whole story. It looks like maybe there is a risk of talc increasing your risk of ovarian cancer by about 20%, but only when you reach the menopause. The talc turns out to be about as mild a carcinogen as they come, only causing a slight risk and only once you're well into middle age. But yes, it just about sneaks into the category and becomes sort of the June Macon bobsleigh team of carcinogens. I have to say, though, that things are rarely that simple. To me, it looks a lot more like a case of the problem that bedevils this kind of study, both in medicine and in biology in general. Just because two sets of numbers show the same pattern, or are correlated, to use a statistician's word for it, it doesn't prove that one causes the other. Correlation is not equal to causation, is how this is often put. There are plenty of comical examples of this. Uh, for example, the number of people who drowned falling into a pool in a given year correlates with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in that year. More seriously, for some time it was believed that smoking increased your risk of committing suicide. This wasn't particularly controversial. We all know that smoking is bad, so seeing another charge added to the sheet didn't seem a big deal. 
There was even a plausible mechanism. Smoking reduces serotonin levels, so that might well be depressing. It was only when somebody looked at the correlation between smoking and being murdered that doubt was cast on the conclusion. Smoking increases your risk of being murdered in exactly the same way as it does your risk of committing suicide. So in fact, the chances are that smoking is more prevalent in the kinds of tough environments where murder rates and suicide rates are high. So even if it had turned out that the risk of getting cancer had been strongly correlated with the use of talc, that would not have been enough to prove the link between the two. You'd still need to have at least some plausible explanation of how it might be working before you could draw a conclusion that was more than just speculation. When you start looking at subsets of the data, you increase the risk of picking up a false correlation considerably. After all, there is a lot that changes when you reach the menopause, and increased use of talc might well be one of them. At the very least, you have to conclude that whatever is going on between talc and ovarian cancer is clearly not a simple story if there is actually anything going on at all. The stock trade of scaremongers, like the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, is to ignore the complexities, cherry pick the data to find the studies that support the case they are trying to make, and ignore the correlation, not equaling causation fallacy altogether. Watch out for that. Same tactics work for lawyers trying to get big payouts for their clients in jury trials as well. I'll put all the references up in the blog post, so you are welcome to plunge in and wade through the data yourself if you feel that way inclined. I have a feeling that in the future, when there is more data, better understanding of cancer itself and better tools for assessing a person's history of exposure to talc and other possible relevant factors, that the apparent 20% increased risk that you might be concerned about will be revealed to simply not be there. Certainly, the most recently published study from 2012 showed no association at all. Any explanation for what is going on needs to explain why the association is not always found. But you might be saying, well, it's all very well for you to say that. You don't have ovaries, do you, Colin? And I don't want to take the risk. That's fair enough. Our tolerance of risk is a very individual thing, and I have no right to impose my opinion on anyone else. But I started this review of the literature not to assess whether or not talc was carcinogenic, but to work out the risk of using it. What exactly does a 20% increase in the risk of ovarian cancer look like? Let's run the numbers. Ovarian cancer is rare. The number of new cases of ovarian cancer was 12.1 per 100,000 women per year, based on 2008 to 2012 cases. It is most frequently diagnosed among women aged 55 to 64, exactly the age range where the possible risk kicks in. So if we accept the worst case scenario, using talc might increase that figure to 14 or 15 per 100,000 from the age of about 50 onwards. So. Using talc might increase your risk of ovarian cancer very slightly if you are approaching your 50s. I personally cannot distinguish between a risk of 12 in 100,000 and 15 in 100,000 and so wouldn't myself trouble about giving up talc. One thing I wouldn't do though is switch to another powder. If we can see that talc constitutes a risk then we have to also allow that alternatives such as cornstarch may well pose the same risk or even a greater one. We just don't have enough data to make any comparison between the two. So if talc worries you, so should all other powders. Talc remains fully legal and approved in both the United States and Europe. I really can't see any case for banning or restricting it. I suppose a warning on the pack might be arguable, but it's very difficult to see how a warning could be worded over such a low risk, and one that isn't even very well established in the first place. I think it would simply alarm people to no good purpose. I hope you have found this interesting and enlightening. Researching this topic was an education for me. One of the things I realised by plunging deeply into this case is just how hard it is to study the long-term effects of chemicals to which we're exposed over a prolonged period. Talc has actually come out of it pretty well. As a cosmetic formulator, I don't have the luxury of being whimsical about product safety. I always have to be ready to abandon an ingredient at any time if a new problem is identified with it. Talc might still turn out to have some hitherto unsuspected downside, but it looks a lot safer to me now than it did before I troubled to look at the data in detail. It would be a shame if the current controversy were to drive it off the market. It's 
often pointed out that being natural doesn't make something safe, and this is true enough, but talc, as it happens, looks very much to me like it's both. I'll try and talk about something a bit less technical and scary next time, but in the meantime, thanks for listening.